Good morning. This is Bill from Curious Cars on another, you know, muggy, crappy, humid Florida Monday, which just makes it worse. You know, the weather has been terrible, terrible lately. We're deep into November. I was certainly expecting some kind of little you know, cooling down, which I guess we've got to some extent. I mean, we've got the, to the extent it makes the northerners happy when they come down, but not me. I mean, we're talking highs in the mid 80s, some nights higher today, lows in the 70s. It just, you know, this is another winter where we're just going to be cheated out of any cold snaps. It's going to be all this crappy, sunny, middle of the day tropical sun weather that I think just absolutely sucks and to top it all off it's humid this morning so you know I don't know I just can't attain happiness here it turns out year round I just thought the summers were awful you know all nine months of them but the uh, the winters uh, it turns out are going to be pretty crappy too so uh, carrying on you know look I apologize I haven't had a lot of videos up lately obviously you know if you're following this channel you're getting radio silence for most of it, but uh, that's because I have been slammed and busy uh, getting like 15 cars ready for this premiere auction that's coming up. So uh, I've got to dump them. I've got to dump them. I'm getting them up there. They just got to go. I mean, they're they're just clogging up the whole enterprise. I've got nowhere to put them, and uh, we'll see. I mean, I'm running cars, which are nice and clean, but, you know, at ground zero of what was a hurricane a few weeks ago. We'll see if people remember that. You know, cars like this one, they had indoor storage for the hurricane, but uh, and people in Florida, you know, know what was affected and what wasn't. But to a guy in Michigan, he just thinks the entire state of Florida was underwater. So we'll see if we can overcome that hurdle. Uh, but that said, I've got a bunch of those things going up there. I've been working nonstop on getting them ready, and uh, that's why you haven't seen too many videos. But I should have a couple in short rapid order this one and tomorrow with any luck i'll do that cosworth vega and uh, we can have a bit of fun with that so we're just going to keep rolling uh, what i have today is a 1987 cadillac eldorado and this is a bit of a rare bird because frankly they just didn't make that many of them which we'll get into as we go uh, first of all let's just keep the pimp comments to a minimum i mean obviously it calls for some of it. There's no question of that. Uh, but this is way more of a Pauli Gaultieri, you know, Sopranos, New York mob, retired New Jersey firefighter sort of car uh, than it is a pimp car. Uh, the differences are only subtle, uh, but they are there. For one, there's no lanterns on the hood. I mean, that's kind of a dead giveaway right off the bat. Uh, you see lanterns on something, you know you got a pimp coming. Uh, number two... There's no fur. There's no instances of fur or velvet anywhere on this car. And, you know, that also speaks to uh, who is driving it. That said, you know, a pimp could take this thing and uh, make it, you know, pimp worthy in very short order, much shorter order than he could, you know, many other cars. But uh, as it's set up now, I think the differences are there. They're subtle, but they're there enough. Uh, but look, let's get to the point. This is an 11th generation Cadillac Eldorado. And, uh, you know, an 11th, uh, it, it, that's a lot of generations. And it was a bread and butter car for Cadillac that always sold well, or at the minimum was a halo car. You know, going back to those stainless roofed hand built things that may not have set sales records, but they certainly made Cadillac, you know, appear on people's radar screens. So uh, the Eldorado and its uh, four door stable mate, the Seville, uh, were extremely important cars for the company. And uh, even in 79, with the initial downsizing, that was an elegant and stately car it probably gave Cadillac a false sense of security that it sold so well despite being downsized and uh, continued you know to set 
good sales numbers for them. This one didn't. Uh, this was an absolute disaster for Cadillac, and I'd argue mostly because it was built on negatives. Uh, the primary motivations for this design were fear and regulations, and those just aren't good things to base a design on. Uh, the fear came from the idea that gas prices, and of course it was promoted in you know, pop culture media at the time, uh, would continue, uh, continue to rise exponentially. It would, you know, they were like $3 a gallon, more than anyone had ever paid. They were going to keep going up, it would become $6 a gallon, and basically the large traditional American car would become absolutely obsolete. Uh, so Cadillac had that in mind when it was building it. Uh, the regulations came in the form of the federal CAFE standards, which is uh, corporate average fuel economy. And uh, that was the federal government sort of decreeing that every car maker's products on average across the whole lineup would have to get a certain amount of fuel economy. And Cadillac decided to take that to heart and try and make it happen. And, you know, that was another big issue for them. Uh, the Europeans, they decided to just ignore the CAFE standards altogether. Uh, what they did is build bigger and more powerful cars, and they just passed on the cost of the uh, fuel mileage penalty in terms of a gas guzzler tax on the window sticker, and that worked very, very well for them. Uh, the car was also a victim of then GM chief uh, Roger Smith, uh, kind of made famous by that, uh, what the hell was his name, that fat guy with the slovenly attitude, uh, Michael Moore. He made that Roger and Me movie, which uh, sort of had Roger Smith as an unwitting co-star. Uh, but anyway, he had a laser focus on making... F you see that bird swooped in. Let's keep an eye on him. Uh, he had this laser focus on making front-drive cars. That, he thought, was the future of GM. And front-drive cars are just anathema to the car market, even today, never mind in 86. And uh, you couple that with GM design chief uh, Irv Rybicki's edict to only offer conservatively styled, you know, formal roof, traditionally styled vehicles, uh, which, you know, spoke to a fear of offending long-term Cadillac buyers, uh, you know, that didn't want to have something that looked all new and weird and different. So what they tried to do uh, is what Bill Mitchell called tailoring a dwarf, uh, you know, famous GM designer, and that was make a very luxury car uh, on a much smaller platform. And, you know, while it could be thought of as somewhat normal today, at the time it was just freakish and bizarre. Uh, so, and then you have the, you know, the whole cross-platforming thing, the idea that all the cars would have the same basic design across all the different platforms weakened the individuality of an exclusivity of Cadillac, and they looked like Buicks and Oldsmobiles, so why not just buy a Buick and Oldsmobile for a lot less? And, uh, you know, that's what, um, that's what sort of hurt him there. Uh, so for Cadillac, this thing was an absolute disaster. As much as new Coke had been for Coca-Cola, except this had much more long-reaching effects. It would take them about two decades before they even began to get a coherent corporate strategy together again. So uh, this was a massive, massive failure for them uh, that could be felt decades after the fact. And frankly, the sad part about it is is it's really not all that bad a car. Once you get into it and start driving it, you're, you know, it's a better car than the world reacted to. But the problem was it just wasn't a Cadillac, or at least it wasn't what people thought of as a Cadillac. Uh, and I mean, how could look? So imagine some boisterous nugget jewelry, white suit, bolo tie, riverboat gambler. Uh, driving a 76 Eldorado to the Cadillac dealership to trade it in in 86 or 87. He gets there and he sees this thing. Uh, you know, he takes his, you know, almost 17 foot long, 5,000 pound 76 Eldorado in there and uh, ends up seeing a 15 and a half foot, 3,300 pound Eldorado that to him looks like it could fit in the trunk of his car. I mean, that guy in about 10 minutes is going to be at a Mercedes-Benz dealer trying to screw bullhorns down over the uh, over the star emblem. Uh, it just wouldn't work out for him. And, you know, today it might, but back then it was just a bridge too far. It was just too much downsizing, this, uh, uh, this second effort that they did. And uh, it hurt him really, really bad. Uh, 
a lot of buyers made the switch to European cars. And the flip side of that is that it didn't work to attract European buyers. I mean, these things were advertised as being lighter, nimbler, better handling than the traditional Cadillac, tighter together, uh, more European in form and function. And uh, it wasn't. I mean, you look at this thing with its pimp mobile grill and its chrome wheels and its cabriolet roof. You know, it's not going to drag over the guy who had made the switch to BMW. It just isn't. I don't care how good it drives. So they didn't get those people either. And, uh, you know, it, they had a touring package, which you could get, which was really supposed to be European. But a guy who went in the showroom and saw this thing sitting next to it thought, man, I'm just not going to be this guy. And uh, he would trek back to the uh, Jag or BMW or Mercedes dealer. And uh, that, as a result, made the sales of this car plummet, absolutely plummet. It had replaced the aging design of the 85 model, which had come out in 79. And it was down 72% from the sales figures of that car, which is a massive drop, particularly when a new car, a newly designed car, is supposed to sell much better than the car it replaces. So uh, it was a absolute crash for them. And in 87, this year, it didn't do any better. In fact, it got a little bit worse. And, uh, you know, the, interestingly, the similarly downsized Sedan DeVille, which came out the same year, uh, actually came out in 85. Uh, that sold pretty well, but I think that was just because the really, really old people uh, found that they could drive a smaller and more maneuverable car uh, that still had sort of stitched leather and wreaths and crests and Cadillac, you know, appointments on it. And they didn't have this giant thing that, you know, where they ran over the neighbor's toddlers or anything. I mean, it was just easier for them to drive. And I think that's why the Sedan DeVille did okay. Uh, but the Eldorado in Seville had always attracted a younger and more stylish buyer for Cadillac. That was the point of them. You know, going back to like 67, that first front drive Aldo, uh, that had European sort of credentials to it, uh, that attracted the hipsters. This car did not. I mean, they had absolutely zero interest in it. They were having no part of it. Uh, some of them went to Ford. They went for the more stylish, you know, Mark 7 or the Lincoln Continental. Ford wasn't hampered by the idea that the car had to be styled traditionally, and uh, that worked out okay for them. Uh, others went back to the Germans or Jaguar, uh, you know, bigger, more powerful, cars despite the gas guzzler tax that were what these people seem to want and a few more went over to Acura which was Honda's new luxury car upstart uh, which did well right off the bat and would soon be followed by Lexus and Infiniti and uh, that doesn't even count the future of SUVs and luxury SUVs so the whole luxury car market was about to become very very crowded and uh, Cadillac was positioned terribly for it absolutely terribly at their worst and uh, they were also facing sort of a reverse xenophobia uh, at this time. You know, there was this, you know, the early 80s had not been good in terms of quality for American cars. And uh, that bad taste that they left in people's mouths were persisting. And, you know, the elites, the, you know, northern urban types, they thought Cadillacs were gauche and dated and, you know, pimpy and they wanted to be in European cars. They, they could say that the quality control was bad and it worked. and uh, So Cadillac was just facing all kinds of uphill battles uh, at a time when the Europeans were coming into their own and could basically do no wrong. So uh, in 88, they made it a little bit bigger. They stretched the front and rear end caps, basically. It was kind of a panic redesign. And uh, it did help the sales a little bit, uh, but still got them nowhere near where they had to be. And that continued all the way through the final year of the this car in 91. Uh, the 12th gen came out in 92. It was a bigger, more substantial car, and uh, it did sound a little bit better. But that's all kind of a shame, because it really isn't that bad of a car. I mean, judged by today's standards, uh, the small size and heavy luxury mix wouldn't really be as freakish. I mean, it's not uncommon to see smaller luxury cars today. Uh, compared to previous Cadillacs, it handled very well. 
it got pretty good fuel mileage and uh, sacrificed, oddly, very little interior room. The whole car was basically uh, built around the size of the interior, so a uh, big guy could get in it, drive it, and not feel like he was in a small car. And currently, the collector car market seems to agree with pretty good examples of these cars pulling in surprising money. Uh, some of them are even tracking higher than Corvettes of the same vintage, which is, of course, a much more collectible car. Uh, but that's small consolation to GM, who, frankly, really got their asses handed to them on this thing, and it's a painful lesson that, you know, took them a couple of decades to get over, and still probably lingers today, despite almost anyone who had anything to do with this thing having long since retired. So, anyway, look, I'm going to take a break there, and then we're going to get directly into this particular car and uh, see what we got. So bear with me one moment. You know, this weather is unbelievable. I mean, first of all, you can see all the mist in the air, the humidity, which is just nasty. And now I've got this soft, revolting, hot rain dripping down on me, fogging my glasses, putting beads all over the car as I, you know, do this. And this is just, again, this is how Florida is fucking me. It's, it's unbelievable that I have to suffer through another hot, humid winter. And I tell you, I've just about had it, so... Anyway, look, let's just get into it. This particular example, this 87 Eldorado, is a perfect example of what went wrong at Cadillac. I mean, for one thing, you've got this smaller car, three feet shorter uh, than the uh, mid-70s cars uh, that, that wore the Eldorado name, a couple feet shorter than the 79 through 85. It is small. They gave it European headlights. They swooped the front end down a little bit to make it look more, you know, modern and avant-garde. Uh, and yet, dealers would take those cars, which were supposed to look more austere and European, and turn them into this. Uh, they'd put this Pimpmobile grill on the front. <laughs> it's absolutely ludicrous. You see, it's a CE for classic Eldorado. Uh, it had a gold hood ornament, the gold kit. I remember when I worked at the uh, Buick Cadillac dealer as a kid, uh, at the Cadillac detail department, there was this room uh, that was filled with all the gold. You'd open the door and it would be just big, ah, you know, you'd be blinded by all the gold uh, glare from the uh, rows and rows of uh, gold kit that dealers would put on these cars and sell for obscene money, uh, which this car obviously got. Uh, you see it has gold fender light indicators, gold hood ornament, gold grill. Uh, it's got gold wreaths and crests on the cabriolet top on the side. Uh, it's got this incredibly ridiculous continental kit on the back, a phony spare tire that you have to bend down to get in the trunk. Even the luxury luggage rack is gold. And on that note, who the hell uses a luggage rack on an Eldorado? I mean, it is a pretty good sized trunk. What the hell are you going to put up there other than infants or toddlers or, you know, young kids? You could strap them down. Otherwise, what do you put a Gucci bag on the back? I mean, it's just for show. Uh, it's got a plaque here. Uh, custom Gold Edition by Ed Morse Cadillac. That's a Southwest Florida dealer. Uh, and of course, he glued all these Eldorado and other emblems on and charged thousands for it. And it was just a terrific, terrific profit center for them. But basically, they took this sort of fresh European-inspired design, if we're going to be generous, and, uh, you know, made it look like something a pimp would wear. Yeah, I'm not okay. A retired New Jersey firefighter. Uh, but it just, you know, it was the way the worlds were conflicting at the time. So, and it didn't work. It just didn't work. You had stainless belt down at the bottom of the door line there, the middle of it. You got more gold wreaths and crests around the lock. You got chrome door handles. You've got this white cabriolet roof with sort of simulated opera windows. Uh, you got this formal curved roof line in the back, which is nice and looks pretty, but uh, again, in this incarnation, it just seems all kind of strange. Uh, it was the first Eldorado not to be a hardtop coupe. It had frames around the window glass. First Eldorado to have that. Uh, in the traditional sort of 90s styles, they went into the roof, which of course helped with wind noise. And I will say this, this was a big part of this car's charm, is that it's incredibly quiet. And uh, not just in terms of, you know, they did a pretty good build quality on quieting the car down, sealing 
sealing the doors, sealing the windows, uh, putting in all sort of soundproofing insulation, you know, around the interior cabin. And uh, of course the V8 helped as well. So tell you what, let's just get into this thing. We're going to hop into the trunk for a minute. We're not going to hop into the trunk. That's for the kids. But all right, to lower this silly thing, there's a little pull right down here. If you do this from the button in the glove box, it all does it itself automatically. But if you're the back, you have to do that. So now you can lean your Continental kit back. You can see where the original license plate would have gone. Oh, this is just hilarious. Uh, here's a gold uh, Cadillac escutcheon for the, the keys. <laughs> Oh, and you can hear that uh, coming up. But there you have a nice big trunk, and it's finished well in traditional Cadillac style. You know, it's burgundy to match the color of the car. It's got a nice Cadillac mat there. Uh, this guy has his Chilton's manual and Cadillac shop manual and some other crap. It's nice to see with the car. And, uh, you know, again, it's a pretty decent size. You could put a lot of people in there. Uh, but uh, otherwise, you know, whatever. Why have a luggage rack? And there you can see it has that uh, nice little suck down thing. And of course, then you have to sort of inelegantly push this thing forward. Let's have a look under the hood. I'm gonna speed through this because I'm getting rained on by hot, miserable, humid Naples rain right now. Oh God. Oh, I think I have to move to Wyoming. Uh, okay, so here was another problem for this car, uh, and that is this digital fuel injection HT4100 V8 that was a carryover. You know, Cadillac ran into misery with their 864, uh, the diesels, uh, they were putting Oldsmobile engines in them. Uh, they would go on to have Chevy engines, and power became kind of a misery for Cadillac. Uh, it got better in 88 when they moved the, the 4 point, they bored it out a little bit, they made it the 4.5, it got more pep and uh, became a better engine, or at least better thought of. Uh, but this one, 86 and 87, they're still running this 4100, which, you know, really wasn't up to the task. I mean, uh, it has 130 horsepower, 200 foot-pounds of torque. Uh, the E-body that this car is, it was shared with the Buick Riviera and the... Um, uh, the Oldsmobile Toronado. Both of those had V6s, not V8s, but they put out more horsepower. And again, why the hell would you want to go buy a Cadillac, which was like 28 grand at the time, when you could buy a 22 grand Riviera uh, with the 3.8 V6 that put out more pep? Uh, this thing now it is quieter than the V6. It's smoother and lower rev than the V6, and that is a help. Uh, but uh, you know, when you're looking at the statistics, it didn't help it at all. Uh, they turned it, it sideways. This was the first and only use of a sideways transverse mounted V8 uh, in the 80s. And uh, they made it a four speed automatic to it, uh, you know, with overdrive. It had full independent suspension, a Corvette leaf spring, mono leaf spring in the back running traversely, uh, you know, four wheel disc brakes. There was a touring suspension package, which absolutely, you know, worked great and the car was considered to be very good handling at the time but it was sort of lost in the rest of the malaise and didn't work out for him uh, with the 4.5 it got better later on it would get the 4.9 I believe in 91 which was better still and uh, became more of a uh, desirable car but at this year it still had this 4100 which was you know sketchy at best uh, but uh, you know is adequate to the job of motivating the sort of light car down the road. I want to say 0 to 60 is about 12 seconds. It got under 10 in the next incarnation. Uh, but the people who drove them didn't feel much in the way of complaints. It still had some pep, still felt good, and frankly it drove heavier than the Buicks and Oldsmobiles, which I think were a plus. So, Alright, I'm going to pause it there because I'm getting drenched. I'm going to put my crap inside the trunk, and then we're going to hop in the interior go for a drive. So, bear with me one more moment. All right, it's now raining harder and heavier, so let's just get in this thing. Christ's sake. <laughs> you know, you gotta love the burgundy white contrast in this car. I wish I could stand outside and show you more of it, but I'm getting drenched, so let's just fire it up and see what we got.
All right, so look, there it is. You can see that 4100 fires right to life. Very nice. The car bangs at you a little bit, which is irritating. It's got some unusual sounds that seem more BMW to me than anything else. Uh, instead of the clicking with the turn signal, you get this thing. You know, yeah, there it is. I like the digital readout, but apparently the, uh, you know, buyers at the time preferred the full analog setup that you get in the European cars. Uh, inside, and I think this is, again, fear from GM. You know, it's like those restaurants you see on the Hell's Kitchen episodes where uh, the guy is terrified to lose his early bird special crowd so he doesn't change. Well, I think Cadillac had that going. Uh, so they did not make the interior, and let's get some air on. God, it's roasting in here. I can't see through my glasses. I don't even know which to push. I have to guess. I think it's auto. Turn the fan down a little bit. All right, there we go. You got some cool air blowing. Uh, but anyway, so here it is. So it does not look that stylish and European inside. What it does look is really traditional Cadillac. Uh, it actually has real wood trim. Uh, I think this was a special order because that was supposed to be on the Biarritz models only, which this is not. Uh, but that certainly looks like real wood trim to me all around the instrument panel and the uh, steering wheel on the center console. Of course, the center console even being kind of European, although you could get the these cars uh, with a bench front seat. Uh, but anyway, there you go. You've got this sort of liquid crystal display with your fuel mileage, your digital uh, speedometer. You've got hey, this thing has just turned 30,000 miles, uh, which is absolutely incredible. Uh, very low miles on this car, and it's actual. Uh, over here, you've got your Twilight Sentinel, uh, obviously made by the same guy who named Cruise Control, and just a terrific old GM name, Twilight Sentinel. What that does is turn on your lights for you and turn them off. Uh, otherwise, they're push-button affair there. Uh, over here, you've got your wipers, you've got your cruise control, uh, you've got your mirror control, you've got a Delco Symphony Sound uh, Auto Reverse Equalizer cassette deck befitting of a Cadillac at the time. Uh, down here, you've got um, your automatic climate control, you've got a nice big trip computer, down, you know, it gives you range and instant economy and average economy and uh, engine data gives you the cool and temp all your gauges your volts that sort of thing kind of cool how much fuel you've used uh, you can uh, English metric and of course your uh, outside temp date and uh, time which is all very nice uh, you get a nice sized ashtray there lovely uh, you've got uh, your center console you've got this sort of trick center console center console shifter this trick sort of thing where you keep flipping it and you can have a cup holder or you can have your coin stuff so all very cool uh, you got a center console compartment there's some stuff in there from the previous buyer there's some cassette storage there was like a three thousand dollar option for a cellular phone uh, during this time that not many people bought but it was there uh, you get over here it has an interesting glove box that pops up instead of down uh, there's a convenient spot for your fuses your trunk release uh, this one came with a lot of books and service records and this was kind of interesting this was the build sheet for the car which if you examine if I can even get it open oh god uh, would give you all the stuff that was ordered on this thing and you know what was kind of interesting manifest where it was built you know the options that sort of thing kind of a neat piece to still be with it all the gold key service stuff and uh, nice that all this is still with the car, even what probably passed for a protective plate back then. So uh, there you go, well documented and nice. I'm gonna put that back in, get that back down, lovely. Uh, up here you've got more white headliner. You've got, um, I don't believe this is the Astro roof, it's an ASC, so this was probably dealer added. Uh, but it works just as well as an Astro Roof would and looks exactly the same. In fact, uh, ASC probably made the Astro Roofs. Uh, there you see the incredible white bucket seats. That's so Cadillac. Wreaths and crests in them. Uh, in the back, your Canadians are going to be chipper as hell. Even if the legroom's a little iffy, uh, they do have a nice wide seating area with a uh, center console if you don't have three people. Uh, I like the design of the door panels with the Delco Bose speakers and white fur. 
her and uh, the uh, dual power seats. You know, I think it all looks very, very nice and proper and uh, befitting of a Cadillac. And when you're inside, it doesn't really feel uh, like it's too small. Um, outside it certainly looks that way but inside it feels like a pretty big car and uh, you know if dealers had just done a better job of getting those guys inside the car they might have sold a bit better anyway let's get my seatbelt on go for a spin you know you look down the hood you got your wreaths and crests there uh, the mirror is a little bit, you know, could be in a Camaro, but it's fine. Uh, this is going to be, I think Peter had his gate fixed and actually sped up a little bit. Let's see if it's quicker. Yeah, you know, look, I think that's a little bit quicker than it has been. So kudos to Peter. I don't feel like I'm waiting 20 minutes for the thing to open. We can't really test Dalton's windshield because uh, he did a crappy detail job on this thing. Can't really tell. And by the way, if these things are flickering in the video, it's just the refresh rate on the camera matching the refresh rate on the cluster. They don't flicker at all, but there's not really anything I can do about it when I'm driving. There we go. You know, it's got V8 torque. And here's the thing, man, it's really quiet and smooth. And that's one of the things that won me over on this car when I first drove it. I mean, because of course it has a terrible reputation as a Cadillac, but when you drive it, it feels like a Cadillac. It drives kind of heavy. Um, you know, it's not, it's not got that insane V8 torque of the pre-Malaise cars, but it feels like the best of the Malaise cars in terms of acceleration. I mean, it doesn't, you know, feel wanting when compared to a 1987 Brome rear-wheel drive. Uh, I can see why a guy who would drive that car would feel fairly comfortable in this one. And uh, that counts for something. You know, Cadillac did a tremendous job uh, designing the, uh, the ride, the feel of the suspension, the steering is not loose. It's, you know, even, in, what, 40 years later, whatever, how old this car is, the steering feels great. Uh, it's uh, it's nice and smooth. Uh, the brakes, four-wheel discs, they feel pretty good. Um, going down the road actually feels nice in this car, and maybe that's why they do pretty well on the collector market, is that uh, it's just a nice car to drive. And it is quiet. I mean, it's shockingly quiet. Uh, you don't get any kind of gurgle burble from the V8, which of course a lot of people like, but I don't think the traditional Cadillac buyer wanted. Uh, he just wanted that torque and a nice quiet ride. And in this car, he got it. So it's definitely not gonna set any land speed records, but you know, it keeps up with traffic. It'll run 85 on the interstate or more. And uh, you know, has a nice soft, lovely thin steering wheel that does feel like you know traditional Cadillac stuff but again that's what I like and the European guys at the time did not so outside you've got this sort of small Euro inspired body inside you've got this you know right out of the 60s and 70s Cadillac luxury it's just sort of a car that really didn't know what the hell it was doing and uh, at the time when it was contemporary that did not work well for the company at all so anyway, look, there it is, uh, 1987 Cadillac Eldorado, uh, 30,000 miles. This one's pretty damn mint. Um, it's another one that I always, can, I, you know, I buy these things, I think, man, I'm gonna keep this one. I, I just delude myself because I have nowhere to put them. I just don't. Anything that I keep is gonna be outside too much of the time and is gonna turn to shit. So it's going through the auction. That's that premier, auction group, Punagord Auction, this coming weekend, December 2nd and 3rd, uh, this one will be up there and, you know, whatever it goes to, it goes to. So if you have an interest in it, you can see it there. I'll put a link to uh, the auction site and proxy bid where you can bid online in the description below. And, uh, you know, for any, if you're one of these guys, if you're a retired New Jersey firefighter, retired New York mobster longing for what you had in the 1980s, well, here it is, look no further. <laughs> and it's pretty mint. So anyway, look, thank you for having a look today. Hopefully we have better weather tomorrow when I'm going to try to do that Cosworth Vega. And uh, we will see you with the next one. Take care.